Hi, everybody, and welcome, and thank you all for, for joining. My name is Anne. I'm one of the co-organizers of the Fasten Off Yarn Along. Um, I'm also known as Annie B. Knits, and my pronouns are she and her. Um, I am delighted today to have with us four of our participating designers, uh, although actually I think I have six of our, of our uh, participating designers. Four of them are actually on this official panel, and I've just dropped their names and their links into the chat there. Uh, so we have Connie Lee Lynch, we have Rachel Sandler, we have Joanne Fowler, and we have Sarah Dawn. And uh, of course, we're going to have our, our designers introduce themselves. Um, and I'll get each of you to tell me a little bit about your design business and how that got started. Not don't need a ton of detail, but how, how the heck did you did you get into doing this weird thing that we do? Uh, so just because I have this in the order that it's in chat, Connie, can I start with you? Sure thing. All right, you got me, you can hear me? Yep, Okay. you're good. Okay, well, um, I am Connie. I have been designing and teaching crochet for, uh, what is it, 23, about, about 10 years now. So I actually started out, I first learned to crochet when I was maybe 10. My mother was homeschooling me and she decided that it needed to be part of our home ec studies. Um, I hated it. <laughs> I thought it was terrible. <clears throat> she made me make a couple doilies with worsted weight, variegated yarn. And one of them, which I do still have actually, is like this groovy neon palette. It was just absolutely outrageous. And I, I did. I hated it. But fast forward about 10 years and I was in the Army Reserve. I was in Kuwait and I had been in college. I was in my junior year when I got deployed and I realized that I'd been so busy with school and working and this and the other thing that I wasn't being creative anymore. And so I started dabbling in, I think I started doing some scrapbooking and some cross stitch. And when I got back home, I decided to pick up crocheting again. And I I bought a condo. I was living in Missouri if I wanted to finish my degree at Mizzou. And I called up my mom one day. I said, hey, I picked up this sampler booklet from Walmart or wherever. And I can't remember how to do this thing. Can you help me out? And she said, Connie, you want me to teach you to crochet over the phone? I said, yeah, it'll be fine. Come on. <laughs> and she did. So I, I started out with working on those little sampler squares and it pretty quickly actually evolved into scarves and blankets that I did for gifts and I started doing custom orders and I couldn't find designs that I liked or I would find a design and I couldn't comprehend the instructions. I got frustrated and so my mom again with the wonderful advice she said so design it yourself. I'm like I can't do that. You know she said why not? I said, oh, okay, well, let's, let's see what happens. And here I am. I almost never crochet from anybody, other, anybody else's design anymore because I can't keep up with my own ideas. So, yeah, it, it definitely had a snowball, snowball effect getting into the design just, just with that little permission slip, you know, that little challenge from my mother. You know, why, why not, why not design? So I did. There we go. I can click on things properly. That's <laughs> such a great story. Um, Rachel, how about you? Um, so I started knitting and crocheting and cross stitching uh, probably close to 20 years ago now uh, when I was in middle school. Uh, ooh, that sentence actually hurt to say. Um, but I only started designing, uh, I want to say it was 2020, uh, Aroha Knits, a uh, very cool designer, did a free uh, sort of workshop series of, you know, designing your first cowl, I think is what the series was on. Uh, and I had a ton of fun with that. And I 
just took off with it. And I've been, you know, trying to design mostly knitting, mostly shawls uh, over the last few years. Although I have my first hat in uh, test knitting right now, and I'm hoping to branch away from shawls a little bit. That's great. Um, next up, Joanne, how about you? How did you get into this weird world? Um, well, growing, I came to it much later, maybe than a lot of people, because uh, growing up, I didn't like knitwear. I, I, not at all. N jumpers, so as we call them in the UK, pullovers, were big, square, straight. And I liked very shaped garments. And so I sewed because I thought that's how you got a shaped garment. You took fabric, you cut it up, you made the darts or the princess seams and things like that and cut it up. And then one day I was in a big department store in central London, John Lewis. And for some reason, I must have gone in and looked at the knitting patterns. I don't know if they were by the sewing patterns. And I saw a pullover, a short sleeve pullover, so kind of a T-shirt, and it had darts in it. And I could see it had darts in there. I had no idea how they'd done this. And I thought, I want this. I asked around knitting relatives if they would like to make that for me. And I probably shouldn't admit that to other people in it because we all hate it. When people do that and nobody would, oh, they're going, oh, it's a bit complicated with that kind of darted look and so on. And I thought, okay, I'm going to have to learn how to do it. So I sat there with a pattern on one side and the instruction book of how to knit on the other side. And I made this very shapely tea. It was kind of a raglan, but a, a sewn together raglan, which these days is unusual and uh, very darted under the bust and fitted in and um, fully fashioned side seams and everything. It, it was lovely. It was really nice. Um, and that's what got me started. Um, and then I knitted more things. I realized I could suddenly have all this knitwear that was a nice shape for me. Um, and in the summer, I thought, well, knits are a bit heavy maybe I'll crochet so I started crocheting and still again because I sewed I knew how to make and adapt things and what shape the garment should be really so once I'd learned the techniques I was able to do things like putting short row shaping in for the bust um, increase the waist and bust shaping if I wanted to and that kind of thing with crochet I realized I could actually do all that just by eyeballing it and trying it on as I went along which was much harder in knitting mm at that stage of my uh, skills. And so I worked to my own designs kind of right after after that very first pattern, I was kind of doing things myself because it was easier. I could picture the sewing pattern pieces and I'd made my own patterns for sewing by then to, to fit me. And so that's what I, I would picture that and then knit the size. And so sometimes my pieces would actually be like a sewing pattern that were all seamed together like a princess line dress. Um, and so that's, how I got into designing um I found there was a little bit too much overlap in the day job because I was a teacher so there's lots of writing and designing and planning and things like that um and so I didn't actually start publishing my designs until I'd given up the day job to take a career break for looking after my children and uh so that's when I, I thought maybe this is something that I could actually do as a replacement for my previous career which wasn't very family friendly so that's uh, <laughs> That's how I started doing it. I love it. I actually did a knitting project. Oh gosh, I, it must be about three years ago now, but I made myself a sweater from a sewing pattern yes. uh, because I found that my yarn actually didn't change much when I blocked it. The gauge actually worked. So then I pretty much just like knit, held it up to the pattern, used some magnets to make it sort of lie on the I was doing this on the side of the fridge because it was the only flat surface available um and, uh, <laughs> and actually it worked beautifully now it was a, a oversized boxy garment so it didn't yeah. need to be exactly perfect but it was actually really fun to think about the sewing and knitting and sewing and knitting and like yeah. okay well I don't need a steam allowance but I do need ribbing and I all of that was was super fun um, Sarah, how about you? How did you get into designing? Uh, well, I have to start with how I got into knitting, which was I was four and it was a form of physical therapy for fine motor skills. So I hated it. I, I remember vividly just throwing, throwing the needles across the room and having a tantrum. It's only a four-year-old can. <laughs> um, I made an ugly, ugly yellow scarf for one of my dolls. It was full of holes. And I, why? Never again. No, 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 not doing this. Because I had to, when the adults were saying I had to, and this sucked, and I sucked at it. <laughs> so yeah, not a good start. 
But my mother who was teaching me when she passed away um, when I was quite young, but my father in a moment of foresight just took all of her sewing and spinning and weaving and crochet things and put it in a storage for me. And at about 10, I pulled some of it out and thought, I remember this. And it's not as terrifying as I thought it was. Okay, okay. And then off and on, I would go through it. I'd knit for six months or crochet for six months, put it all back in storage, pull it out like four years later. And it, in 2012, I found Knitty Magazine. And then from there, I found Ravelry before it imploded. And from there, I was like, there's fiber stuff online. And then I never stopped again. <laughs> um, fast forward to 2016. And I had uh, lost a job that I'd loved just due to budgeting. We were government funded. The government said, oh, we're not funding you anymore. So I'm like, okay, I got to go find another job. Eh, oh, okay. But interviewing with a wheelchair is, we'll call it interesting. <laughs> um, you get really interesting and very rude things said to you. We'll just leave it at that. And I'm like, why am I doing this for jobs I don't even want? Like, none of them, they, they were going to pay the bills, but they weren't jobs I wanted. At the same time, I was realized I was designing patterns in my head. Because a friend of mine was like, hey, could you make me this hat? And I'm like, yeah, I would just put it together like this, like just thinking in my head. And I went, hey, I just wrote a pattern in my head. Wait, what is this? Uh, and so I just saw the thing saying my internet might have gone weird. Anyway, uh, and so that's how I got into designing because I was like, oh, I can, I can do that. And I can sell these. Hang on a second. This might be a job. <laughs> and then I will make my own job. Because if you won't hire me, I'll just make my own job. And so that is what I did. That's how I got into designing when I realized that I was already kind of writing patterns in my head. Because if this is how a hat goes together, if this is how a sock goes together, okay, I can make, make that work. And yeah, so I went to a business course for disabled entrepreneurs, which was interesting because I'd never had a fiber artist that didn't know what I was talking about. And from there, uh, I've just been slowly working away at it. And it's been a lot of fun. And but yeah, that's how I got into designing. Wait, I'm already writing things and I might as well just hire myself. <laughs> That's uh, so yeah, that that's... Attitude. <laughs> yeah all right um let's move on to the next question which is what's your favorite technique in your chosen craft and if you do both knit and crochet then you can you can pick one of them but do you have a thing I'm on a brioche kick um I I just love the squish I can you tell I like being cozy <laughs> <laughs> um so I'm I'm a brioche person right right now um but what's your thing what gets your brain most excited Connie I'll come back around to you so I've, I've definitely gone through phases myself I've, I've been through marling phases and um some some other linen stitch was one that I've spent a lot of time on in the past but really for me it's not a specific stitch or technique it's more an exploration of texture I like trying new things and a lot of my designs actually come about from questions that I get from crochet students so I like to use that as a jumping off point kind of create, sometimes I create designs as like a teaching aid and a, a lot of that is just an exploration of, of color and texture and kind of seeing what happens when we do things this way or that way. So, yeah, I, I don't have a specific stitch, although I do, I do, do still really like the linen stitch. It just makes a great fabric. Um, but yeah, I would say texture is really what gravitates, what I gravitate towards. Um, and not like popcorn stitch texture. <laughs> More, more subtle texture, like working into the third loop or, um, you know, things like that and post stitches. But yeah, not like big in your face texture so much as, as more the subtle stuff. Not fun fur? You know, I don't know that I've ever crocheted with fun fur. I have crocheted <laughs> with some, some fuzzy yarns to make like little stuffies, but I don't think I've ever tried fun fur. <laughs> Rachel, how You never know. You? It's true. We'll say knitting with fun fur substantially easier than crocheting with fun fur because you don't have to try and hunt for the stitch because it's just on the needle. Uh, so yeah, I have done both. And if I had to do it again, I would absolutely knit with fun fur again before I would crochet. Um, my big thing, I usually, at least when I'm designing, gravitate towards cables. Um, I feel like cables are a really fun way of 
uh, sort of adding a sense of motion to something that's very uh, flat. Uh, and even if you aren't working at a gauge where something's very drapey, it still still adds some, you know, fun curves to it. So that's my answer. All right, uh, Joanne. You'll all hate me. I like the seeming. <gasps> we all need a friend who likes seeming. <laughs> and I will swap it for blocking, even with transatlantic postage. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I think that's probably one of the things. That, it's a bit more than the seeming. It's the construction. So working out if I'm going to work sideways on something or do a raglan or the, the construction of the garment. So that, that's always the interesting bit for me. And doing something in a little bit of a different way, especially. So um, I did a kind of, I don't know what you'd call it, a cape. Or, it's almost like a bathrobe or kimono type design, but the back of it is a a giant granny square basically set on the diagonal. And so for me working out that as a that kind of thing is really interesting to me working something or if if I made someone else's pattern and it's constructed in a way that I can't even start to picture from looking at the picture I have no idea how this has worked and I just have to trust the pattern that's the interesting technique for me it's how it all comes together as a final yep. piece I totally buy patterns just to like read and how the heck did you do that so definitely uh, Sarah, how about you? Uh, so first off, I'm probably going to also see another one where you're like, why do you enjoy that? I, I like weaving in ends. I find it meditative. <laughs> so I, I will just put on a podcast and like zone out for a couple hours and just weave in all the ends. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, in terms of techniques, it's, if you look at my designs, you'd see weights and cables, but in reality, I will do most things. The only thing that I found I don't enjoy our brioche because I have not made it work. <laughs> I end up with a mess. I want to learn it, but I have not grokked the instructions on how you actually make a fabric out of that yet. Okay. And amigurumi because they're just too fiddly to be enjoyable. Like they're beautiful patterns, they're adorable, they're cute, but making them is how many legs and arms and tails and noses do I have to sew on? No, <laughs> no. So, but anything else is kind of fair game. It's I enjoy a lot of it. It's more the parts that there's the very few things that I don't quite as enjoy as much and yeah so that is yeah that is that <laughs> that's fair um all right the next question and these I should say these questions were kind of crowdsourced from our um, attendees and our participants so we're asking the same set of questions on all of these uh video panel interviews so uh by the end, we'll have a set of a whole set of videos of, of folks asking and answering these same questions. Um, so the next question is, do you prefer designs that challenge you as a designer or ones that you can crank out with ease? So are you, you know, knocking out another hat or shawl or whatever, or are you going to try and completely invent a new technique or somewhere in between what's your what's your thing connie i'm i'm probably somewhere in between i like having a challenge in the creation process in the designing but usually that small scale like something that i can sort out in a swatch size whether that's combining stitches together and working up the math to make sure that they line up right um or whatever but when it comes to something like the complexities of a garment not not so much <laughs> i like having something that i can work out at the beginning and then create a piece from that point outward uh i really like being able to maximize the yarn so i like doing things where you can just kind of work until you it's the size you want or you've run out of yarn that's actually how the size is determined <laughs> on a lot of my designs is just well how far can i get with the yarn doing um so yeah, it's, it's, it's in between for me, but I think that a lot of my designs end up being, you know, once you've done those first few rows, it becomes easily memorable and you can keep working on it um, while you're doing something else as well. So not, not completely beginner easy all the time, mm -hmm. but not 
not super complex either, except for the occasional like stitch pattern or stitch sampler style extravaganza pattern, right? Those are fun to do sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Rachel, how about you? So I'm also sort of in between. Uh, for me, all of my patterns are inspired by something that has to do with physics, uh, which is what my education was in. Uh, so for me, the challenge part is how do I take this physics concept and translate it into stitches? How do I, you know, what is the essence of, uh, you know, this idea and how do I make it come across in knitwear, but then actually making the thing once I figured out the pattern, I want it to be pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, a, a couple of my patterns are sort of, you know, intermediate, but for the most part, I want them to be pretty beginner friendly, like a good place to start if you're looking to to learn how to do cables or something like that, or something mindless that you can you can work on while watching TV. Um, Joanne, how about you? I think I would definitely say more towards the complex. And I think I want to move this year more in that direction. I, for me, designing things is really interesting. The things that I, I like to design things that I find quite intriguing. Uh, for me, this is my main career. So I don't have another career that challenges my brain like Rachel. And then this is something that I'm doing more for relaxation and, and pleasure. This is something where I have to get the brain challenges in, um, in order to keep me motivated. Um, and definitely one, one thing I do find really difficult is if I've got a large expanse of the same stitch for a long time, I, I really struggle with that. I have to make the pattern interesting to make as well. I don't mind a few rows of something boring that you can do while watching the television, but at some point there's got to be some shaping or a complex stitch or something like that. Um, and I love to keep learning. So always wanting to learn new things and then be, be able to pass that on to other people. Um, and also uh, shaping for the figure and trying to design in a way that people can adapt it, whatever their body shape is like. And that that's a really complex thing, but that's something that is fascinating for me to be able to put out one design and say that if you have got broad shoulders um, and a very small bust or no bust and a, a straight waist or something like that you can wear this and also somebody who's very very hourglass could wear this or somebody who's got a, a bigger tummy or wide hips or something it this is what you have to do and I like to include that kind of um uh, adaptation customization in in all of my patterns as as much as possible so yeah I, li I like the complex side of things <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah it's we're, we're getting uh some some thank yous and some nods here about uh also about your your comment about not having <laughs> too huge a swath of the same thing that's that's huge uh sarah how about you so I don't really know where I fall in the complex slash like simple because my design process is that looks cool. Uh, be it a stitch pattern, be it a yarn, be it like one of my designs was inspired by a wrought iron fence. Um, and then I just take it and go. And so sometimes I realize, oh, this is way more complicated than I thought it would be. And sometimes it's, well, this was simple. Um, so for one, one of my beginner patterns is just, it's a ribbed bag. It's just a bag, one in one ribbing, seam the bottom shut, done. And it was because somebody needed a dice bag. Whereas the other one is the almost six foot monstrosity lace shawl with double yarn overs and the edging is done with curved short rows to make the square lay flat. And everyone looked at me like I had lost my mind even more than I already have. <laughs> so I go across the gamut because my, my design process is, that's a cool idea, go. <laughs> um, whatever it is and however that insp inspiration happens. So not very helpful maybe, but. <laughs> but uh, I mean, I think all of the, all of the things are necessary. We we all have to start learning from somewhere. We need those. How do I do a basic bag? How do I learn? How do I make a basic hat? How do I make a basic sock? Whatever the thing is. And then we all also get, I mean, those of us who continue on with it and haven't flung it across the room permanently. <laughs> um, <laughs> No we all we all need to to develop and build and go in all those different directions so yeah, I think you know part of the ADHD brain cropping into of just hey that looks cool <laughs> yeah totally totally um 
All right. So another one of the questions that we had, and again, these are the, the crowdsourced questions. Um, this one really comes about because this is an off Ravelry event, um, because I think a lot of us got kind of used to how Ravelry requires a whole lot of information about a pattern. When you go to list your pattern, when you create that listing, you have a whole lot of information you need to input. Um, and then you can write all of your like romance copy in there all about how wonderful and what a cool idea it is and what if it was like this and whatever. But you have to provide a whole ton of information. Of course, then Ravelry did the redesign and lots of folks can't go there, which is why we have this whole event. Um, but what's interesting is that then as designers are creating their own pattern pages on websites that are not necessarily coded to be part of a larger database, there isn't a standardized set of information that everybody always includes. So what are the things that you how do, you, how do you decide what information you need to share about a pattern when you create a listing on whatever your sales platform is? And how do you go about making sure that this is accessible on a like standalone that people don't need to also go to Ravelry to find other views or other pictures or other other details about what weight is that yarn? What what are what what is your thought process around all of that? Is that something that that you think about much? Connie, I'll start with you. Sure, and yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about it that way, that when you are, are selling patterns on another platform, you don't have this searchable database that, you know, you can you can plug in these this different information. And even before I added patterns, started adding patterns to uh, Etsy, I started adding into the description for my patterns all of that sort of relevant information so you know the the yarn the size um the fiber content the yardage the the crochet hook size and then i also like to include things like the stitches that you'll need to know to to make this design i don't like adding like a uh, a difficulty level because i think that is variable depending on how you perceive things and I've seen a lot of things that are labeled as easy just because they are mostly single crochet stitches but they're not easy like an amigurumi like complex thing with lots of arms and legs might be all single crochet but it doesn't mean it's easy so yeah I don't I don't like using those labels but I do like to have all that information in there that is kind of integral for you to know before you decide on a pattern yeah. But then I also like to have, um, I, I, one of my favorite things about Ravelry, I, I will admit this, is the, um, the gallery they have of people who've made the thing. So you can see other, all the other pictures. And that, that is something that I wish we could have on some of these other platforms. But I started adding a, a gallery onto my blog post. For the each design to show like test or photos and and that's i mean that's the only way that i have thought of to kind of showcase how it how a pattern can can look with different yarns and colors and something like that but i would i would love to hear what other people do for yeah. that sort of thing yeah uh i know that we've got Shayna on here and because she sells off of her own website she does have a gallery of tester pictures in the pattern listing but that's difficult when you're selling on etsy or somewhere else that doesn't isn't, you know fully self-hosted and you have limits and and that sort of thing um rachel how about you uh so when i'm searching for a pattern it's usually because i've either been gifted yarn or i have leftover yarn and i'm thinking what can i do with this uh, so I always put yardage, yarn weight. I usually put gauge as well. So if you're like, oh, you know, this calls for fingering weight, but can I make it with this leftover sport weight? You know, you can just check your gauge and see if you like the, the fabric that's coming out of it. Um, and I like putting information about the um, 
the construction, you know, is this one piece? Is it seamed? Is it worked flat? Is it in the round? Uh, is it top down? Is it bottom up? Because, you know, uh, I think Connie mentioned that her patterns, the amount of yarn you need often depends on like how much you have, uh, which I love. But if a garment is bottom up, you know, you can't do that really. Um, it, or at least it's a lot harder. But, you know, if you're making a sweater from the top down, you can just kind of, you know, oh, this is going to be tunic length instead of normal sweater length because I've got extra yarn and that sort of thing. So I, I want to make sure whatever somebody is looking for, you know, if they're looking for something of that, that sort, they know how they're going to be making the pattern. They know, you know, if they can extend it into infinity if they want to, or if they have to be sort of planning and weighing their yarn ahead of time. Uh, so yeah, along with all of the required tools. I like adding in the, the construction. I love that. Yeah. Joanne, how about you? Well, this is something I definitely thought a lot about as a, I'm a fairly new designer and I designed almost exclusively for magazines and other publishers initially. And then only now am I getting quite a lot of patterns that I can put on a website and sell them. And I wanted to have an off Ravelry option for people um, to choose from whether or not that's just for preference or because of difficulties with accessing Ravelry. Um, and in the past, I actually worked as in education, um, supporting the students who needed any kind of additional support. So I was in a managerial role. I didn't have training with that, but it gave me a lot of awareness. That there are lots of needs. Some of them are conflicting. And that definitely made me feel quite overwhelmed in issues of what do I put out there? So it's something I, get, I had given a lot of thought to. And what I ended up doing initially was just to blatantly plagiarise what Ravelry puts up there. The information that Ravelry puts up there is good, I think. And it's useful. It's helpful. The way it's organised is very good in terms of what order you need to know things and where things are and so on. Um, even down to things like uh, Ravelry lets you list a pattern as being for sale and also free. And I try to make sure I do that on Etsy as well, because um, socioeconomic factors can be an accessibility issue for many people, especially these days. So um, I tried I tried to look at what's on there. And then I, I did look around at lots of other designers' websites to see what they included. Um, but then also I became very aware that this amount of information could be very overwhelming to people without the structured form that Ravelry has. So I had to think about the order of it as well um, and trying to put the important information first so that somebody who becomes overwhelmed with a large amount of information. So um, it could, could be for any reason. It could just be because it's their second language. They've got that important information first and then they can take time to go through. They know immediately if it's a possibility for them, that if it's a shortlist pattern. Um, and I try to have information in different forms as well. Um, so, for example, if I've got a schematic, I don't have schematics for all of my patterns at the moment. That's something I'm working on. But if I've got that, I like to include that on the listing as well um, so that people can see the visual shape of the garment um, as well as being able to read that the bust measurement is such and such and there's ease in there. Uh, and I think another thing that I've try to do to make sure that it's not too overwhelming for people is paragraphing and making sure there's space between the paragraphs and where possible to use bullet points obviously uh, Etsy is my off Ravelry um, shop um, and I can't use bullet points on there but I can put a dash and a space so that it looks a bit bullet pointy when I'm listing lots of measurements and so on um, and I think, think those would be the main things but it's something that I really want to work on as I start to design more patterns independently because I think it is really important even for people who don't have or don't see themselves as having a particular accessibility need the better you present your information to people as a designer the more likely is somebody's going to buy your pattern <laughs> so from from our point of view it's a great <laughs> great importance <laughs> as well <laughs> yep absolutely Sarah how about you uh, so first thing in a second, what Connie said about difficulty levels, I don't use them because what is easy? This is a question. Who knows? Uh, I do the list of this is what techniques you need to know. And then what I'll do is if it's something weirder that like maybe more difficult to search for, I will say like the pattern has a link tutorial or something like that if, it, if it's linked up. Uh, just so like, they did, like this is scary. I don't know what this is. Hang on. There's a thing in the pattern that will tell you. <laughs> um, yeah. And then I do most when I'm putting the uh, that let's try that sentence again when i'm putting the pattern entry up on payhaver or wherever 
Uh, I do a lot of the same thing. I basically put everything that Lori has because it's all useful. And the other thing I do, because Canadian, well, the Canadian thing's weird because we operate in this weird hybrid of metric versus imperial. So for example, if you ask me what a US needle size seven is, I have no idea. But if you ask me to, to count, to measure, I do it in inches and yards. So, <laughs> so I work in both. So I have everything in both, um, both US and um, metric. The thing that's not in, in both is my crochet patterns because that I, I, could, I don't have the brain space to translate that, but to do, do two patterns in US UK terminology, that would be, that I don't have the brain space for that. But I tell people, like, because Ravelry flags it, that on all the my crochet patterns, I say this is a US pattern, like for terminology. So people are not surprised when they open up the pattern and go, wait a minute. <laughs> um, thing I do is because I offer large print pattern versions that are also compatible with screening, screening technology. So I tell people I have that, so they're not confused by the multiple downloads. And also uh, the other thing is that I say like whether it's charted, whether it's written, whether it's both. And for some patterns, like I said, I have the aforementioned almost six foot shawl. There is written instruction for that. It is 40 pages long. So I tell people, if you want that, there's a third download. If you cannot read the charts and you want to go through that line by line, here you go. Um, because that's something I like for visual impaired readers, they cannot read charts. It's this, the screen reading software can't do that. And so I've seen somebody do it. They literally read through it. It's, 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 I could not do that, but I mean, it works for them. So, you know, that's something that I do offer. So all of my patterns, even the ridiculous charts have a corresponding written instruction, but sometimes it's this third download because people get scared by a 50 page pattern. <laughs> um, um, and the other thing that I, I do with that is I also highlight if there's any other stuff embedded. For example, if I have a, my own YouTube tutorial, I have described video for those and they're all captioned. So I say like, yeah, here's caption tutorials. Here's um, this one as a describe video. And the other thing is um, I give my measurements for my patterns. I don't do women's small or men's large because what does that mean? Um, wh why are we gendering clothing? Unless you're in a language where clothing is gendered, please stop. <laughs> um, so I just say like wrist circumference is this, head, you know, head circumference is this. This pattern has, you know, bust starts and waist shaping. This pattern has wider shoulders. So it doesn't need to be gendered. It's not gendered. And that makes it hopefully more relevant because that means that you don't need to know you know, what, what is a woman small versus, oh, you know, this is a seven inch wrist circumference or whatever. I, I'd figure that's just more useful in terms of giving those sizes rather than the mystery of what is a man's large. <laughs> uh, so that's the thing I do there because uh, gendered clothing annoys me. <laughs> I I appreciate that. And I so feel it. My sibling is non-binary and we, we have that rant frequently about gendered clothing and sizing and buying men's sizing versus women's sizing and especially when you get into the plus sizes uh any sort of standard just goes completely out the window and it is just bananas all right um just keeping an eye on the time we've got 20 minutes left um so i am going to wrap up two questions together into one um for each of you next one is tell us about a particular design of yours that you think people would love making and having and owning and wearing or using or whatever but that hasn't really taken off um and also tell us what's coming next what what, what should we look forward to seeing from you uh connie i'll put you on the spot again first <laughs> Oh, a design that I love that hasn't taken off. Um, I have a scarf that's called Sibilinity. And I had so, it was one of those designs that just kind of magically came together. And like there was this inspiration and I found the perfect colors. And it was just so much fun to create. And it's a beautiful piece. It's got a little color blocking. There's a, a mini stain gradient in it. And I adore it, but it just, I don't know. It doesn't, hasn't resonated with the right audience yet. So that, that would probably be, be my piece um, that, that I love that just hasn't really done very well. <laughs> and well, as far I'm as, just throwing the link in the uh, chat. <laughs> oh, awesome. You were fast. <laughs> <laughs> and then as for what's coming up next, from me, I am actually, I've been working on a, 
uh, membership idea that's going to be based around a resource library with video content that is searchable by keyword. So everything will be captioned, there will be transcripts, and so you can type in whatever stitch you're interested in or technique, and then any video that contains that technique or stitch in my library will pop up and list for you to pick from. And I think it's going to be a really incredible resource to offer. And I'm kind of excited about the possibilities of what I can do with a, a more intimate membership sort of um, connection with my people. So that's, I haven't actually announced that anywhere yet because uh, it's still in the works, but that's, that's my big project for the next year. That's super exciting. Uh, yeah. Rachel, how about you? Um, so I think my favorite pattern that I've created is called optical. Uh, and I love it because it is a, a very short pattern repeat. Uh, it's a triangle shawl uh, with a very short pattern repeat. So you can you know work until your yarn runs out. And I designed it specifically to work really well with like busy and variegated yarn. Um, so if you know, you have that one really busy skein of sock yarn and you don't know what to do with it and you don't want to just make vanilla socks, uh, especially if it's like not, I said sock yarn, but you know, especially if it's not like it, it doesn't have any nylon or something and you're like, I will wear through these in 0.3 seconds if I make them into socks. I don't want to do that. Uh, I think it, it fits really well for that. It, you know, it can fit like a variety of, um, you know, skein sizes, whether it's, you know, 400 yards or 500 yards, you know, whatever weight of fingering weight you have. Uh, it, it's very fun to work, I think, very meditative. Uh, my upcoming projects are not nearly as exciting as Connie's. Um, as I said, I have a, a hat currently in test knitting. I'm working on a set of fingerless gloves, uh, and I've just got this whole list of physics concepts that I want to you know try to get down in stitches somehow and hope to keep working through those that's awesome I can't wait to see Joanne how about you um I'm really struggling with the question on which pattern hasn't taken off because I feel that before I participated in this event and the Indie Gallon Ravelry I could have told you about three or four in that category but during the events, those are the patterns that have sold. So there's it's it's fairly even. <laughs> so I think, oh, maybe, maybe I need to hang around with more knittery and crochet people, but, you know, really into, into yeah. that. Oh, that's and like participating in events and being social around it. And, you know, perhaps they'll like my patterns better. <laughs> so I, I really can't say. Um, I think I'm slightly surprised. I had a pattern that I designed for Crochet Foundry magazine originally uh, called the Woodland Sunrise Hoodie. Um, and I, I'm surprised that more people didn't make that because it, it was just so enjoyable to make. It's got a really enjoyable, relaxing repeat. Um, it's got an interesting construction. Um, even the tech editor had to contact me to say, what order are you making the bits of? All of this in she said because I can see you're making this along this length so you must be working cuff to cuff but there's a neck hole here and there's a, a dividing line here and, and she just she needed to check it so it's one of those ones that you kind of learn where everything is as it grows even though there's a description there and once I explained it a little bit more she said okay the description makes sense I can't tell you to change it but I still couldn't picture it until you talked me through the whole process of making it um, and then it's got motifs as well. And I think crochets really love motifs. So I'm surprised that hasn't been more popular, but I can't say that it hasn't done well at all. It's, it's been, you know, a nice level seller. Um, I think uh, coming up, I'm, I'm starting to move away a little bit from creating for publishers because there are a lot of constraints on what I can do there, the size of the publication and um, so on. And, and I, I would I would like a little bit more flexibility as a designer. So I'd like to release more independent designs. Um, I've kind of analysed my patterns and looked at them and the feedback I'm getting. And I really want to improve my pattern writing in terms of clarity, more visuals in the patterns, those kind of things. So that's something I want to learn a little bit more about. There are some techniques about 
fitting different body shapes and so on um, that I would want to learn a little bit more about. So I'm going to be hopefully producing more effective and more complex patterns. Um, and then also more involvement for my customers. Um, I asked in my mailing list a while back, what do people want from me in the, in the newsletter? And they always said more about what it's like being a designer. So I'm hoping to do a little bit of an event where they can participate along with me right from the conception of a design to the publication. So the, the people who like to follow me on my mailing list or Instagram and so on. Oops, uh, I just totally repasted the same link twice. I tried to put the link to your thing and I failed at the copy in the, Don't worry. <laughs> in the paste. Hang on one second. I'm trying to keep up here. There we go. There is the proper link. Uh, mm -hmm. I was going to put in another plug for another of our participating designers, um, Kate Atherley, who is, you know, tech editor extraordinaire for Nitty and lots of places. She has a phenomenal book uh, it's called the beginner's ride, uh, beginner's guide to writing knitting patterns. Mm -hmm. um, it is excellent. I may be a tiny bit biased because there's one random sketch that I gave her that's in it, <laughs> so I'm like a <laughs> tiny bit biased. Um, but it is so good, and she is so good at clarity. Um, that I I super recommend that um I there have been several books about you know writing knitting patterns but she is the queen of clarity and of it's not always the least wordy but it is there is there is no question what you're telling people to do and I love that brain engagement and she yes Sarah she is also an awesome sweet human too and has a very cute dog <laughs> all the really important things in life right uh sarah how about you helps i bring the microphone back down okay um so first off the pattern that i am baffled has no projects on ravelry despite being published before ravelry imploded uh it's actually one of my freebies that's the tributary hat it's in notions magazine november 2017 so it's an old one um, and I am amazed it doesn't have more projects than it does because it's really fun. I think it might be the copious number of stitches you have to pick up, <laughs> which might scare people off. Uh, I think I've actually got a link. I will throw that for you to save you. Oh, something. sure. <laughs> Could you tell I was looking over at my other? There you go. <laughs> my it's, don't, it's, don't think it's in the, the yarn at long, long database. It's one of my freebies. Ah, so, right. So. Um, but yeah, that is a pattern where I'm like, I don't know why no one's did this. <laughs> Ooh, um, it is fun. The the only thing is it's kind of a one size hat because you knit the cable band around and then you graft it and then you pick up stitches for the crown and then you pick up stitches for the knit for the ribbing. So I think that part scares people off because there is a lot of stitches to pick up. Um, so, but it's not hard. It, yeah, the cable is probably the actually the hardest part. So it's a gorgeous you know. cable. Um, I have been seeing people using those um, like stitch keeper cords, like uh, barber cord kind yeah. of thing that you and you knit it in on the side as you're turning your your work or oh. whatever. And then you don't have to pick up stitches. You've already got or I mean, you could do the same with yeah. just like the cable of a set of interchangeables. But there is a, a way that if folks are interested yeah. in doing that, hat, you might be able to escape the whole thing of picking up all Yay. the stitches um rachel just turned on her side because she's doing some kind of complicated physics experiment <laughs> there she is um so and you have so a, a question yeah oh, okay. mm -hmm. so there's three things uh i have some of them so okay camera i don't know if you'll like this but i've got these socks uh, yeah, Ooh. camera isn't really grabbing, but sort of. Uh, you can't, yeah. The It's a four over one slip stitch, no, sorry, one over four slip stitch cable, and it makes it look like those blocks of the Escher painting tiles. And that's going to be coming out in July and I'm working with Malabrico, which I've been super excited about. Yay. Um, I've got, nope, 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 this one. Uh, this is a work in progress that will hopefully go up. I, it, I don't, the camera does not like the cables on this. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> Uh, but it is a cabled hat that I have to do a second prototype for, and then it will go out and start getting tested and all that fun stuff. Not sure when that's going to get released, but that's what's on the needles. 
And the exciting news um, is that I will have my first garment pattern published for the magazine in the summer. I don't know how much more I'm allowed to say than that, but that's the other exciting news. So yeah, there's the summer magazine issue coming up where it's going to be my very first published garment pattern because garment patterns are hard and I had to learn how to grade. <laughs> uh, so those yep. are the three kind of coming up things for me. So yeah, there you go. That is all so exciting. All right, folks, we have approximately seven minutes left. Um, so uh, I do want to open things up to our audience for questions. We don't have a huge audience here uh, while we're doing the actual live recording. Hopefully we'll get lots of folks watching it online later. But for those of you who are here in the audience, I'm sure that you have questions for these folks. If you have questions for one specifically or to ask all of them, please feel free to uh, to raise your hand or just unmute yourself and ask. Amber? Hey, um, this has been great listening to uh, all of your feedback um, to the questions. Um, my question, and this is for anyone who wants to answer, is what excites you most about the future of the fiber arts industry? I'm laughing here because Kathleen has dropped into the chat that she wants to admire how Amber's sweater matches her chair, which it just mwah, is beautiful. <laughs> Completely not an answer to your question. But uh, Sarah, is that a hand up from you? You have an answer yeah, I there? Can, I can jump in on that one. Sure. Um, so in addition to viewing stuff in the sort of knitting and crochet world, I ended up also in the sustainable fashion world. Because, you know, if you spend two months knitting a sweater, you probably don't like what you damn well want it to last. And that got me into, like, all the stuff around, like, such shop labor and, like, fair wages for textile workers and all that front. And I think we're seeing more of that in the fiber arts. I think it's a great thing. We're seeing we're seeing talks of uh, fair wages for sort of shearers and farmers and what the domestic wool supply looks like in Canada, which is wonderful. We've got the Upper Canada Fiber Shed. Amazing people. Check them out. You know, we've got all this stuff of – and I'm seeing it across the U.S., too. And even in, I know the UK has got some like um, field to, to wool production as well. And we're seeing like, talk like sheep and regenerative agriculture. And I'm loving all of that. We're just seeing so much more awareness of the supply chains ish stuff that pops up, not only in wool, but in, in textiles in general. And I think that's a really good thing because I think knitters and crocheters are, we're aware of how much effort goes into making a thing. <laughs> so we know when we see like the $2, you know, crochet top, that mm, there are questions that need to be asked. <laughs> so I, I think we're seeing that and I love it. I just love the fact that I, you know, that we're seeing domestic wool, we're seeing traceable wool, we're seeing fair trade stuff, we're seeing discussions of animal welfare, we're, we're seeing functional non-wool alternatives, just all of that. I, I love to see it. <laughs> so yeah. That's awesome. Uh, anybody else? Joanne? Yeah. Yeah, I think... Um... It's, it's a little bit of a pairing to what Sarah's uh, saying there. I really like the way that Sarah's mentioned there from the, the sheep to the the yarn sale and, and the design and so on. And I quite like that we've also got that connect, the connectivity in two ways between the designer and the wearer and the knitter or crocheter. Um, to taking things through to the end of the chain people can give are able to give feedback very easily um via social media uh via designers online shops in the past um thinking about when i, I was young my mum would buy a knitting pattern or a crochet pattern in a yarn shop there would be no indication as to who the designer was even on there she wouldn't have been able to give any feedback I mean, she could probably write to Rowan or whatever yarn company it was and say something about the pattern. But the chances are the designer would never hear that. And I think as designers that that's actually amazing for us, that we're able to connect with our uh, potential wearers and, and makers and find out what they really want from us and respond to that so quickly. Um, the, the online world is is really amazing for that kind of feedback and 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 being able to be responsive to the people who are your customers. Yeah. Honey? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, as working on trying to, to build on an idea for a membership, you know, this idea of connection with people is, is obviously really important to me. So so I agree. I mean, I think that these these last few years we have made 
pretty incredible leaps and bounds with the help of technology like Zoom in, in being able to connect people together. Um, and it's just, it's, it's pretty wonderful. So I'm, I'm excited for what the future holds in, in my ability to connect with people, not only makers, but, but also, you know, people that I can collaborate with, whether that's other um, designers for, for events like this or independent designers. I, I really love getting to know the people behind the things that I'm working with, like that like the yarn or, or the tools or notions, whatever. And so I think that, um, yeah, that idea of con connectedness, no matter, no matter where you are, <laughs> is, is pretty amazing. And I'm looking forward to seeing where, where we go from here. Oh, you're making my event organizer heart so happy. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel, how about you? Yeah, uh, continuing on with the connectedness idea, um, you know, I've I've heard of knitting circles and and that, but I don't live in an area that really has a local yarn store. I've never had friends who knit or crocheted. Even when Ravelry was accessible to me, I was never really in the forums. I didn't find that interesting. Um, but I feel like nowadays, Discord uh, and other things like that, they're just so much faster than forums are. They're so much more instantaneous. It's so much easier to have a conversation with many people. And I feel like that has finally let me like meet other people, You know, even if I never meet them face to face, uh, but meet other people who knit and crochet and love all these things. And I can like crowdsource questions, you know, it's no longer, oh, can I, you know, figure out the best yarn for this thing I want to do on my own, or, hey, what if I just throw this question into Discord and then, you know, an entire conversation will pop up around it with different perspectives uh, and, you know, different opinions. It's like, oh, you know, now it's not just me. And it's not even just me asking the woman at Joanne if she knows anything. You know, it's, I'm getting a, a whole lot of different viewpoints. Um, and I, I really like that. It, it's really finally brought me some form of like fiber or community that I never had before. I love that. I actually, um, my, my local knitting group started because of Ravelry, uh, because one person, and, and this is in a community where we actually have one of the largest knitters guilds in Canada in, in my city. Um, but I didn't know what they were about. I was Still a new knitter I was scared to show to something like that I wasn't a master knitter or anything um but it started out and I think it was like 13 years ago now um somebody just said hey I'm gonna go sit and knit at this coffee shop anybody want to join and it happened to be across the street from my office um and that community we have now shifted even though we're all mostly still local we have now shifted almost entirely to virtual stuff because of COVID and because a number of us are, are high risk still and that kind of thing. So we, I, I live my life completely embedded in that community and it is such a beautiful thing. And to, to connect is one of the reasons that I, I signed up to volunteer with this event and I'm now one of the organizers, just because that, that community and that, that sense of sharing the sharing the sparks as well as the frustrations and the joys but sharing the oh my gosh other people get this is such a beautiful thing um so on that note uh we have actually hit our time um I want to thank you all so much for this fabulous conversation uh fabulous feeling of connectedness um and uh i am going to just for those who are here in the in the zoom i am putting everybody's links again in the chat um i want to wish you a very happy holiday season i hope you all get some time to sit and stitch on something that makes you happy and something that makes you feel cozy or cool if you're in some place warm um you can tell I'm not uh but I hope that you you all have just a wonderful time and we will continue to connect in the uh in the yarn along discord